Good evening, everyone. Thank you for braving the, uh, the storm that is about to pass through here. Uh, my name is Scott Stevenson. I'm the Vice President for Collections, Exhibitions, and Programming here at the Museum of the American Revolution. I'm just curious, show of hands, how many of you, this is your, is this your first visit to the, to the museum here this evening? Oh, shame on you. You're missing Philadelphia's newest and greatest attraction. Um, we are very proud. We've just passed our year anniversary. Of course, we opened April 19th last year. We're getting close to 400,000 visitors that we've uh, greeted since then. About 55,000 uh, school children. That's the organized ones, not the ones obviously who, who arrive with their family. So it's been a wonderful, uh, wonderful year for us. And we're right in the thick of the school group season right now. So if you're visiting, definitely come in the afternoon. Um, gets a little, little crazy down there, but it's wonderful, of course, to see the rising generations of particularly fifth and eighth graders who are coming and, and meeting the founders uh, uh, on a daily basis here in the museum. Uh, so I'd all encourage you all to kind of come and, come and visit if you can real soon. It's my great pleasure to um, introduce Alan Luxenberg, who's going to introduce the speaker this evening, um, uh, president of FPRI. And I understand 42 years you have been associated with this august organization. <laughs> I feel a little bit of symmetry. It's only my 12th year working for the Museum of the American Revolution, but uh, like you, I know you, you, when you've worked all the jobs and the whole organization, you really understand it from, from stem to stern. Um, uh, as I was uh, looking through your bio, Alan, I was struck by uh, one of the great, I think, attributes of the organization is how partnership-oriented you are, uh, both in the, you know, in the region, in the city, and throughout at the region as a way to expand the reach and deliver uh, the programs. And look forward to uh, hearing a little bit about our speaker now from, from Alan. Okay. Thank you very much, and it's... Uh... This is not our first time at the Museum of the American Revolution. We've had a few programs here for students and for teachers, but we're glad to have this great big uh, public program. I'm uh, reminded that uh, one of my colleagues has often stated and restated the observation that um, America is the only country in the world where if you say it's history, you mean it's irrelevant. Uh, <laughs> but. Uh, Given the size of today's audience, I would say that observation is actually not true. Uh, people do care about history. Um, since there are some people who may not be familiar with FPRI, let me just say for a moment that FPRI was founded in 1955 on the premise that a nation should think before it acts. It was good advice then, it remains good advice today. We, uh, our mission is to bring the insights of scholarship to bear on the foreign policy challenges facing the United States. And our method is to look at contemporary international affairs through the lens of history, geography, and culture. And uh, since my colleague Jim Kurth is here, I could quote from him, because he explains this method by saying we study the realities and mentalities of the localities. So it's now a pleasure to introduce our speaker. Today is our first annual uh, Ginsburg Sattel lecture, uh, and it's being given by Walter McDougall as the new chair of, of the, the Ginsburg Sattel chair of our Center for the Study of America in the West. So I want to thank the Stanley and Arlene Ginsberg Foundation and Ed Sutel sitting here. You might stand so people can applaud you. <laughs> this was made possible by a gift from the Ginsbergs and uh, Ed Sutel. Um, uh, Scott mentioned, I didn't actually, wasn't proud to hear this, that I've been working here for 42 years. Uh, actually, one of, uh, I've always thought that one of my greatest achievements at FPRI 
was reaching out to a man named Walter McDougall and bringing him in to the FPRI network, which happened shortly after he arrived at Penn in the late 1980s. And uh, we've had Walter with us for all of these years. Uh, Walter uh, served in the U.S. Army in Vietnam, after which he got his Ph.D at the University of Chicago under William McNeil, the famous, the late, great world historian. And he was hired by the University of California at Berkeley and then came to Penn where he fills the Aloy Anson Chair of uh, International Relations. Uh, Walter has written over 50 essays on our website and each one is a classic. <laughs> So I advise you to go to our website and take a look at some of those essays. Almost all of them are free and open to the public. There are a few that are behind a paywall. Uh, the e-books, I think, cost you $2, and the Orbis articles cost you a fortune. So, uh, but most of, it, most of the rest of everything is there for your use, such as the three reasons we teach history the merits and perils of teaching about other cultures. You can't argue with geography. Journey to the center of Jules Verne and us. The ecstasy and the agony of our romance with flight, a meditation on the centennial of the Wright brothers' triumph. I could go on. Oh, well, I should. Uh, <laughs> meditations on a high holy day, the 4th of July. We republish that every year at the 4th of July. And then uh, there was an e-book that he did for a history institute. We do programs for high school teachers from time to time. Um, he gave the keynote address at one history institute that became an FPRI e-book, and that was William Penn, Benjamin Franklin, and the American Founding, the Philadelphia Factor. The whole weekend was devoted to answering the question, the creation of a liberal society, did it happen in Philadelphia by accident? So it was a really magnificent weekend for teachers, and uh, maybe we'll repeat it one of these days, especially since we now have the Museum of the American Revolution. Um, he's, uh, Walter is also the author of several books. My reason for seeking him out was I read his 1986 book, which won a Pulitzer Prize called the... Uh, uh, the Heavens and the Earth, A Political History of the Space Age. And since then, he has published four other books, uh, two on the history of American foreign policy, most recently published in uh, late fall last year, The Tragedy of U.S. Foreign Policy, How America's Civil Religion Betrayed the National Interest. Uh, that has been reviewed in various places, and some of the reviews say, Professor McDougall is a national treasure. Walter McDougall is America's greatest living historian, remarkable for its breadth, depth, and intellectual daring. And then this review, the most creative and eccentric book on the history of American diplomacy. Now before those, he wrote two volumes on American history, one of which we have for sale at the registration desk, uh, called uh, Freedom Just Around the Corner, about the years 1585 to 1825 or thereabouts. I don't actually have it in front of me for some reason. And then a second book that takes it up another uh, 100 years. Uh, obviously, Freedom Just Around the Corner is related to today's talk. Uh, Walter gave me this title. I said to myself, what do you mean? And, I, and then we settled on a subtitle that said, where did the founders get their ideas? So we're really happy to present uh, Walter McDougall. Oh my, thank you, Alan. That was very, very kind. Uh, there was, however, as usual, one error. Uh, <laughs> I have written five books since The, uh, the, he the Heavens and the Earth, uh, The Two American Histories, The Promised Land Crusader State on Foreign Policy, uh, Let the Sea Make a Noise, A History of the North Pacific from Magellan to MacArthur. I, why do I write these 
big fat books. I, I just make so much work for myself. And then finally, uh, the latest one. Okay. What does it mean to speak of American exceptionalism? It's a familiar phrase, and it's a, it's a familiar topic. Uh, you know, it has been ever since, uh, really, uh, the, the uh, Bush administration, or maybe perhaps even before. What does it mean to speak of American exceptionalism? If it just means America's unique, then the claim is unexceptional because, hey, no two countries are alike. If it means Americans believe their great country is special, again, that's not really exceptional because all great nations cherish national myths. If it means Americans are exceptionally virtuous, given their devotion to liberty, equality, justice, prosperity, social mobility, and peace, then ipso facto, they've also been exceptionally vicious for having fallen so short of those ideals. If it means that Americans are exempted from the laws of entropy, because, as Otto von Bismarck reportedly quipped, God looks after fools, drunks, and the United States of America, <laughs> then, well, then such exceptionalism can't be proven until the end of time, subspecie aeternitatus. Indeed, the very illusion that the, that the nation enjoys a divine dispensation may perversely inspire the pride that goeth before a fall. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Or it might lead to the many bad ends to which reckless adolescents are prone. Finally, if exceptionalism means that America's indispensable status renders uh, the U.S. exempt from the rules of behavior that it makes and enforces on all other nations, why then enemies, neutrals, and allies are sure to push back. Hence, exceptionalism, I believe, is more trouble than it's worth. It either means nothing or altogether too much. But the principal reason to banish the term from historical discourse is that the moniker didn't even exist until the mid-20th century. No Puritan colonist or founding patriot or Civil War statesman or 19th century poet, pastor, or propagandist ever invoked the term. To be sure, Alexis de Tocqueville did call America's geography exceptional insofar as it was separate from Europe. And German sociologist Werner Zumbart thought American society exceptional, an exception to Europe's rules, insofar as socialism didn't seem to have any much appeal to workers in America. But neither man wrote of an American exceptionalism. And the first ones who did, oh my. The first ones who did, Pope Leo XIII in the 1890s and the American communist Jay Lovestone in the 1930s used exceptionalism as a term of opprobrium. It wasn't until the 1950s uh, that, that, uh, when Max Lerner and then other authors like Daniel Boorstin and, uh, uh, and uh, Seymour Martin Lipset turned American exceptionalism into a badge of honor and traced its roots back to Puritan New England. Finally, Presidents John F. Kennedy and Ronald Reagan made American exceptionalism a benign household phrase in order to exhort Americans to victory in the Cold War. But it had some malign implications that became apparent after the Cold War, when Americans pretended their exceptional values and institutions ought to become universal, whether or not other cultures wanted them. So what? So what if the Ur historical claims made for American exceptionalism amount to a civil religious myth? Don't the truths they symbolize about America's new world character 
remain valid? Not really, because common sense tells us new worlds cannot baptize themselves. Only people from a self-conscious old world can conjure or baptize or name or discover a new world. And of course, that is exactly what happened in the centuries after 1492. Europeans began to speak of America as a new world, promote America as a new world. A British skeptic has observed the following, quote, not even the Puritans were impelled by a unique or exceptional American impulse. On the contrary, they were products of European education, European culture, European piety, and were engaged in a great European quarrel called the Protestant Reformation. Some 140 years later, American colonists did gather here in Philadelphia to reject European rule. But the principles they invoked were the beliefs of the English Revolution and the Whig tradition in the English, Scottish, and French Enlightenments and in the ancient principles of English common law. In short, the core beliefs of a European civilization." Unquote. Where did America's, uh, the ideas that, on, on which America was founded come from? Well, historians have, in fact, dug deeply into the political theories of early modern Britain and unearthed the ideas that led in the fullness of time to the American founding. One familiar source is the Bible, especially the Hebrew republicanism mandated in the book of Deuteronomy and then realized for three centuries following the conquest of Canaan by the Israelites as recounted in the book of Judges. The former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, a brilliant man named Sir Jonathan Sachs, he's someone else you should Google and read all of the articles that he's posted on his website, uh, Sachs has explained that the covenant made by the Lord through Moses was a blessing, but also a curse. A blessing if the children of Israel obeyed their Lord's commandments, but a curse if they turned away to other gods while in the promised land. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live. Thus did the Torah establish, for the first time in history, the spiritual principle of free will. But Rabbi Sachs insists that it also established three highly political principles. First, the divine sovereignty of God doesn't remove human responsibility. And Moses warned that unless the people are faithful, nothing can save them, not their armies, not foreign allies, nothing. Second, the, the Israelites are collectively responsible. They are the archetype of what the American founders would call we the people. Michael Walzer uh, put it uh, himself in his book, God's Shadow, Politics in the Hebrew Bible, that the 12 tribes of Israel constituted an almost democracy. And then third, Rabbi Sachs says this political order was centered on God because he was the lawgiver. Therefore, the Israelites were the first to imagine themselves one nation under God. Sachs has also explained why Many English scholars in the mid-17th century all of a sudden became eager to learn Hebrew and read rabbinical midrash literature. They wanted to know whether the Bible ordained monarchy or condemned it. And if God condemned monarchy, that meant that Parliament's Puritan rebellion against King Charles I in the 1640s was God's will. Well, they found that in Deuteronomy 17, Moses prophesies 
the Israelites will eventually desire a king. And he warns them only to appoint kings chosen by the Lord, insofar as they strictly adhere to the law. So evidently, the Lord does permit monarchy. But in 1 Samuel chapter 8, that prophet is angered when the Israelites finally demand a king, quote, so as to be like all the nations, unquote. Well, the Lord, Samuel prays to the Lord, and the Lord laments this. He says, don't worry, Samuel, it is not you they have rejected, it is me. And yet, he instructs Samuel to go ahead and anoint a king. And in so doing, says Rabbi Sachs, the Lord established the principle of popular sovereignty, government by consent of the governed. Predictably, as Moses and Samuel had both prophesied, the kings and their subjects in Judah and Israel apostatize and suffer a nearly unbroken succession of wicked kings until finally both kingdoms are conquered. Well, such was the price paid by free people who failed to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with their God. Professor Eric Nelson, in his book, The Hebrew Republic, <clears throat> Jewish Sources and the Transformation of European Political Thought, has studied the supporters of Oliver Cromwell and his Republican experiment, uh, who poured over all these Old Testament texts. And of course, that process was, was greatly enabled by the fact that Cromwell repealed the old expulsion of the Jews from England, which had dated from the year 1290. Well, one of these Republican thinkers uh, during the Cromwell era was none other than the great poet and statesman John Milton. He concluded that, well, the Lord did permit monarchy, but he nevertheless condemned it as tantamount to idolatry. Algernon Sidney and James Harrington likewise damned monarchy uh, for sacred as well as for secular reasons. They advocated republicanism instead. Moreover, Professor Nelson <coughs> shows that as corollaries to this Hebrew republicanism, Sidney and Harrington also promoted a redistribution of wealth inspired by the elaborate inheritance laws of the Torah and, most surprisingly, religious toleration. To be sure, Britain's Puritan commonwealth didn't survive for very long. Cromwell died a couple years later. Uh, the, the, the long parliament reconvened, restored the Stuart king and the Anglican church in 1660. But the ideas survived and partially triumphed in Britain's glorious revolution of 1688. And a century later, it inspired colonists, such as Princeton President John Witherspoon, the Scots Presbyterian called over to become the president of the College of New Jersey, as it was called then, uh, and it was Witherspoon who educated James Madison and a host of other American founders. Well, all of that is deep background to a very familiar event. In 1774, Tom Paine sailed over from England to Philadelphia and within 18 months had sniffed the wind, figured out what made Americans tick, and published the pamphlet that persuaded Congress to declare independence. Now, Paine himself was an Enlightenment skeptic who had no use for religion. Yet the central argument of common sense was precisely God's prophecies about the evils of monarchy. Paine had lifted the argument directly from John Milton. Thus, Hebrew republicanism, filtered through early modern England and then transplanted to the colonies, 
was one familiar source of American institutions and values. And that, is what, and that also explains why clergymen throughout the 13 colonies, not just New England, preached revolution from their pulpits, made exodus their national metaphor, told Americans they were a new chosen people, and sang with their congregations the popular 18th century hymn, to the king they shall sing hallelujah, and all the continent shall sing, down with this earthly king, no king but God. That's the familiar source. But there was another, far less familiar one, a source which many Republican philosophers of the 17th and 18th centuries consciously suppressed, lest they repel their audiences. That second source came as a surprise to historians, too. They didn't even stumble on it until a woman wrote a book in the year 1945 beginning to, ex to explain all this. And that second source was born in Southern Europe, Catholic Europe, and seemed the very antithesis of biblical morality. That second inspiration for the English Commonwealth men was the notorious observer of Renaissance statecraft and the founder of modern political science, Niccolo Machiavelli. Now everyone knows Machiavelli's essay, The Prince. It's short, provocative, and quotable. It's what the, what the French call a success de scandale. And in it, Machiavelli seemed to advocate arbitrary rule ruthless tactics, deceit, and brute force. Indeed, the principle that the end justifies the means. Machiavelli had no use for established religion, except as a sedative for the lower classes. He urged princes to inculcate religion in, in their subjects, but he himself uh, was a scoffer. And indeed, Machiavelli seemed to believe that moral corruption was necessary for political success. The kindest label given to him is realist. The worst is monster. In England, he became so notorious that old Nick became a sobriquet for the devil. Well, later on, we'll challenge that stereotype. But first, let me take you on a tour of a city some of you surely know well, but which I only came to know four years ago when I gazed into a distant mirror. In 1978, Barbara Tuckman wrote a, a book called A Distant Mirror, The Calamitous 14th Century, in which she described the crises that had wrecked the high medieval era. They included the bubonic plague, which killed a third to a half of all Europeans, the Hundred Years' War between England and France, the, ter the terrifying Muslim onslaught by the Ottoman Turkish Empire, the crisis of religious authority born of a papal schism, and more. And by distant mirror, she meant to imply that the 1970s reflected similar existential crises. Well, I thought Tuckman's analogy was rather overwrought. Oh, the Vietnam War, the Arab oil embargo, stagflation, Watergate, they were certainly bad, but hardly equivalent to those medieval calamities. Nevertheless, over my long career, I've learned to appreciate distant mirrors. The high medieval era, for instance, reflects also so much that we value today and flatter ourselves to think of as modern. Consider this list of things whose roots lie in the Middle Ages. The rule of law, English common law, the separation of church and state, limited monarchy, 
parliamentary government, Magna Carta, 1215. The first universities founded in the 11th and 12th centuries. Natural rights, the first expression of what we now call human rights. Rural and commercial capitalism. All sorts of technological breakthroughs from the moldboard plow and the mechanical clock to the water wheel and the printing press. And the restless, curious, ambitious spirit that moved Europeans to build ocean-going ships and begin to map the world. We only think of the medieval era as stagnant, superstitious, and brutal because Renaissance humanists imagined their own era, a rebirth of the glories of ancient Greece and Rome, and they dismissed the medieval millennium rather than admit the obvious fact that their Renaissance itself had grown out of it. The Puritan John Adams, who certainly had no affection for the Catholic Church, grudgingly realized that fact when he wrote that somehow, quote, people in the Middle Ages became more intelligent in general, unquote. Interesting. Ah. Oh. But distant mirrors also reflect other things. They reflect for instance, exquisite beauty, which is something I learned when I finally accompanied my wonder wife, Jana, on a journey to Italy. I say accompanied because she did all the logistics, all the planning and staff work, made all the arrangements, and I just happily followed her around like a, uh, like a happy puppy dog on a buy. Everything about Italy the history, the art, the architecture, the scenery, the cuisine, everything was sublime. But for me, on that first journey to Italy, the capstone was Venice. Now, Americans take pride in having lived under our Constitution for 230 years. The British have lived under their unwritten Constitution for 330 years. But did you realize that the most serene Republic of Venice lasted over a thousand years? From the 700s until 1797, when that brigand Napoleon abolished it? Imagine walking through ancient streets and peering into churches built four or five hundred years before the Columbus discovered America. Well, the islands in the lagoons at the northern edge of the Adriatic were first settled by refugees fleeing the Lombard invaders, the Lombard barbarians, one of the tribes that brought down ancient Rome. But then the, these early Venetians got reinforced by the Lombards themselves who fled from the Frankish armies of Charlemagne around the year 800. The, col the colonies, here's an aerial photo, the colonies' politics in these early centuries were turbulent. But the creative Venetians soon took advantage of their geography, and, uh, uh, which was unique, to found a city-state, not a kingdom, a city-state devoted to sea power, aggressive commerce, and precocious republican institutions to preserve their liberties. Their leader was an elected duke, the Doge, who served for life under a sacred pledge not to abuse his powers. And just to be sure no Doge did, as the centuries passed, the Venetians invented all kinds of institutions that checked and balanced the executive power of the Doge. They created a Senate a great council, an executive council in charge of war and diplomacy, and special councils for other functions, including a secret bureau for internal security, and another for naval construction and recruitment. By the 14th century, the Venetians had fashioned a thalassocracy, 
That's a wonderful Greek word I learned from Professor McNeil in, uh, in graduate school, a maritime empire throughout the Adriatic and Eastern Mediterranean. The Venetians pioneered trade routes to Northern Europe, the Byzantine Empire, the Ottoman Empire, Persia, and, thanks to Marco Polo, China. And there are maps of all of those places dating from the 15th century, maybe, or 16th century, painted on the walls of the Doge's map room in his palace. Well, this surprisingly modern commercial republic in the midst of medieval Europe grew immensely wealthy, thanks to the, uh, the shrewd doges, councils, and merchants, and thanks to the intelligence gathered by the diplomatic embassies, also of Venetian invention, stationed abroad in foreign lands. The Venetians outfitted the Crusades and claimed the lion's share of the plunder. Venetians monopolized the spice trade, and Venetians patronized art, music, and public works. But perhaps their most striking achievement was a highly developed civil religion. Venice was nominally Roman Catholic, of course, but it was able to defend its liberties against the pretensions of the Pope and the Holy Roman Empire alike, thanks to its island status and naval power. Venetians were also receptive to anybody who was able to contribute to their economy, including Muslims, Jews, Greek Orthodox, and later Protestant Germans, Britons, and Dutch. But what Venetians really worshipped was the city itself, symbolized by its patron saint, Mark the Evangelist, whose very bones, a Venetian expedition in the year 828, purloined from a crypt in Alexandria, Egypt. The Arabs had overrun Egypt by then, and the Venetians stole this, the bones of this Christian saint right out from under Muslim eyes. How did they do it? Well, who knows. But according to legend, the raiders smuggled the relics past Muslim officials by stuffing them inside a shipment of pork. The, iconogra the, icono the iconographic symbol for St. Mark is a winged lion, which one encounters all over Venice to this day. To be sure, the city kept the Catholic Church calendar, but it also celebrated civic triumphs with feasts, carnivals, and liturgies. The Doge's palace is a treasury of frescoes and sculptures displaying the glorious history of Venice and celebrating its republican virtue. This is the Sala del Maggiore Concilio. It's the largest room in Europe. There, you, no, no, nothing, nothing, nothing can, can, can do justice to, the, to, this, to this room except to stand in it and awestruck and wonder. In this room, the Great Council's 1,500 members convened in a spirit of equality under a frieze round the ceiling comprised of head busts of the first 76 doges. The grand fresco by, by Tintoretto was supposed to depict the coronation of the Virgin Mary as Queen of Heaven but Tintoretto's son, who completed the largest painting in Europe, changed it to the Virgin Mary interceding with Christ on behalf of the Republic of Venice. There are still other frescoes, however, that pay obeisance to Neptune and Mars, as if the Venetians were hedging their bets. The classical gods, of course, of sea of the sea and of war. St. Mark's Cathedral and the Doge's Palace are quite literally joined at the hip. What prouder expression of the civil religion could there possibly be? Well, in war and diplomacy, the Venetians shunned entangling alliances, except in emergencies, 
when they would organize coalitions, the most famous of which was the Holy League, whose fleets routed the Ottoman Turks in the 1571 naval battle of Lepanto. But Tintoretto, celebrating that victory, kind of forgot there were other members of the coalition and entitled the allegory, The Triumph of Venice. Well, alas, by the 16th century, Venice was beginning to suffer the effects of the dire historical, historical trends that would hurl it into a long, languid decline. There was the Ottoman conquest of Byzantium in 1453, the Spanish and Portuguese discoveries of sea routes to America and India in the 1490s, the perennial wars ravaging Italy following invasions by France and the empire after 1494, and the rise of national monarchies in Spain, France, and England. It really speaks to the credit of Venetian institutions, civil religion, and artistic genius that the city's brilliant sunset lasted all the way down to the French Revolution. But what has that distant mirror to do with England, much less the United States? A surprisingly good deal, it turns out, and not only because Britain and the U.S. came to resemble the, the Venetian commercial republic in so many ways, but also because J.G.A. Pocock described in his classic 1975 history, The Machiavellian Moment, Florentine political thought and the Atlantic Republican tradition. In it, he argued that the modern political theory of 18th century America mirrored that of 17th century England, which in turn mirrored that of 16th century Italy. Pocock drew on the writings of Renaissance figures such as Francesco Guicciardini, but especially Machiavelli. Not the prince, Machiavelli's long and serious treatises such as Discourses on Livy and Florentine Histories, written between 1510 and 1530. Pocock meant to educate English readers on the real Machiavelli, the brilliant and brutally honest student of politics, whose purpose was not to advocate cruelty and deceit, but to describe empirically how real princes in the real world behaved. And if most of them were amoral or immoral in their pursuit of power and wealth, then it behooved high-minded, well-meaning princes to do the same, simply to protect their own city-states and their own subjects. To be sure, Machiavelli was hostile to the Christianity of his day, but that isn't surprising, given the papacy had plummeted to its decadent nadir during the Renaissance. But his purpose in separating moral judgments from the facts of political life was simply scientific. He's simply a political scientist. Many people think the first modern political scientist. Moreover, Machiavelli did not mean the word prince to imply a dynastic ruler. It, in Machiavelli's writings, the prince simply referred to whoever was in charge of a state, be he a nobleman like the Duke of Milan, or a plutocrat like Lorenzo de' Medici, or a military condottieri like Francesco Sforza. Indeed, he preferred that princes be men of virtu, whatever their background. Men of virtu, that Renaissance ideal, which meant not virtue, as it looks on the page, uh, but ancient Roman ideals, such as manliness, energy, guile, and courage. And Machiavelli insisted that princes, as opposed to tyrants, used their power on behalf of the common good. In his discourses on Livy, that ancient chronicler of the rise and fall of the Roman Republic, 
He made it clear that he, he made it very clear that he preferred Republican government. And that preference made it imperative for him to learn from the histories and the discourses of classical Greece and Rome why republics so often succumbed to tyranny, anarchy, or conquest, or just quickly aborted uh, in the manner of Renaissance Italy's ephemeral republics. And his voyage of discovery, Machiavelli actually likened himself to Christopher Columbus, taught him surprising things, including the positive value of factionalism, because creative competition among rival parties and interest groups fostered a division of powers and checks and balances. He thus considered it healthy for a state to contain plebeian or populist factions opposing patrician or princely factions. And he welcomed the occasional tumults that resulted because they, they were what inspired the reforms periodically needed to rejuvenate a republic. He advocated an independent judiciary, and he promoted commercial and military expansion because the wellsprings of Republican politics, Machiavelli discovered, were popular greed and fear. Now Machiavelli and Guicciardini were both natives of Florence, but you won't be surprised to hear that for both the ideal model republic was Venice. And by a Machiavellian moment, Pocock referred to those conjunctures when the founders of new republics confront the question of how to build institutions capable of enduring, like those of Venice, for centuries. Now Machiavelli's reputation was, bespir was besmirched during his troubled life. Among other, among other things, he suffered torture and exile. And his reputation grew even worse after his death. The Catholic Church banned his books. Protestants reviled him because he denied, uh, seemingly, uh, uh, the natural uh, rights uh, 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 and natural law, um, uh, and he advocated republicanism simply on utilitarian grounds. He believed that people preferred to live in liberty not because they valued its intrinsic dignity or that they had any natural right to it, but simply because it worked. Quote, cities have not grown either in dominion or riches when not in the condition of liberty, unquote. But for that same pragmatic utilitarian reason, Machiavelli's science of politics lived on among practical people intent on propagating and preserving conditions of liberty. And so it was, a century later and half a continent away, when a parliament declared its king a tyrant, waged civil war against him, cut off his head, and declared a republic in 1649 that England faced its own Machiavellian moment. The leader of the parliamentary army, Oliver Cromwell, claimed that his purpose was to establish a godly commonwealth. But in fact, he exploited power in the manner of a Machiavellian prince to make himself Lord Protector, in effect, in effect a military dictator whose regime oppressed the English and crushed the Irish and Scots. Yet, the very fact that the king had been overthrown and England was a soi disant republic created a space for political innovation, for republican ideas to flourish, and into that space rushed such creative thinkers as Marchamont Needham and James Harrington whose greatest works, The Excellency of a Free State and The Commonwealth of Oceana, were both published in 1656. They restated, refined, and adapted classical Republican ideas about liberty, about how liberty emerged from 
the tensions between patricians and populists, about the importance of mixed government and checks and balances, about the value of tumults and commerce and war. And they explicitly cited Machiavelli as their principal source. Harrington's utopia, described in Oceana, was especially influential. Only it wasn't really utopian. It was the Venetian Republic with English characteristics in which a natural aristocracy, expertly trained in commerce, science, and law, governs the Republic in the best interests of all. Harrington explicitly wrote that, quote, Nowhere else is there so undisturbed and constant a tranquility and peace as in Venice, because civil perfection hath no pattern in the universal world except that of Venice." Unquote. And the purpose of his Oceana was to design what he called an immortal commonwealth that would not decay. Ah, my. Harrington's grand design was never even attempted, of course, because, as I said, the English people and Parliament grew weary of Cromwell's zealous rule and restored the Stuart monarchy after his death. But again, the classical republicanism, largely inspired by Machiavelli, didn't die. On the contrary, it stormed back forth forcefully during the Restoration through such philosophers as Algernon Sidney, whose discourses concerning government of 1680 was an assault on monarchy so brazen it cost him his life. Rather more prudent was Sidney's contemporary John Locke. He skirted charges of treason by uh, kind of fudging his opposition to monarchy and then by coming to terms with a limited constitutional monarchy in his two treatises of government of 1689. Those were the famous books written to justify the glorious revolution of 1688. Locke was also discreet in that he never revealed how profound Machiavelli's influence had been on his thought. But he was, in fact, an avid collector of the Florentines' writings. He studied them with great care. He shared Machiavelli's antipathy toward religious moralizing and diverged from him only insofar as Locke favored peaceful commerce rather than martial expansion. Oh, oh my, but it turned out Machiavelli had gotten that right too. Popular regimes are at least as belligerent as autocracies. For the glorious revolution itself was really an inglorious coup d'etat by a war party in Parliament and the army who called themselves Whigs. The Whigs drove King James II into exile for the crimes of baptizing his son a Catholic, emulating Louis XIV's absolute monarchy, but also for the crime of pursuing peace with France rather than war. So the Whigs, who lusted after French colonies in India and North America, invited James' Protestant daughter, Mary, and her husband, the Dutch stockholder William of Orange, to come over from the Netherlands and reign in England, where William and Mary promptly declared the first of what Americans later came to, came to, to call the French and Indian Wars. Well, that's not all the Whigs did. Of course, they weren't just a war party. They also imposed on William and Mary a decidedly Republican cast of, of conditions. They retained the monarchy, but they imposed all sorts of classical Republican institutions. Between 1689 and 1707, they established parliamentary supremacy over the crown. 
the Bill of Rights, the Act of Succession banning Catholics, the Act of Union with Scotland that brought together the United Kingdom, and the Bank of England to fund a floating national debt, the purpose of which was to finance Britain's wars. Over the course of the 18th century, those institutions made Great Britain the world's greatest power. Moreover, it was during that century that the intellectual movement called the Enlightenment spread throughout Europe and then across the ocean to the fast maturing American colonies. The hyper-rational social scientific qualities of Enlightenment thought meant that the influence of sectarian religion, which had been so powerful during the Protestant uh, Reformation era, was now sharply circumscribed. And in such a climate, it's not surprising that Machiavelli became even more influential, if still not respectable. The French baron, uh, Baron de Montesquieu, the Scotsman David Hume, and the American Benjamin Franklin were just a sample of the 18th century philosophers who postulated with Machiavelli that because human nature was imperfect and immutable, Christian virtue was a fragile foundation on which to build a republic. What republican durability really required was precisely those sturdy institutions checking the vices of, uh, of individuals and groups in society, making them balance each other. Those institutions that the Whigs had established in Britain, which in turn resembled Venetian ones so closely that Montesquieu even called Britain, quote, a republic in monarchical disguise, unquote. In 1705, the Dutchman Bernard Mondeville wrote a famous satire, The Fable of the Bees, describing the Machiavellian methods by which English Whigs pursued parliamentary, commercial, and imperial power. Thus every part was full of vice, yet the whole mass a paradise. And virtue, who from politics had learned a thousand cunning tricks, was, by their happy influence, made friends with vice. And ever since, the worst of all the multitude did something for the common good." Unquote. Alexander Hamilton couldn't have put it better. Now, Viscount Bolingbroke, the author of the 1738 classic, The Patriot King, even reconciled monarchy with republicanism when he commended kings who, who functioned, in effect, as simply chief executives on behalf of the public interest. Delegates at the Constitutional Convention had that book, The Patriot King, very much on their minds while designing the office of President of the United States. Which brings us finally to America. So far, it would appear that I fully endorse Pocock's thesis about the direct reflections of 16th century Florentine thought on 17th century English and then 18th century American ideas of Republican government. In fact, I do not because various intellectual historians have challenged Pocock on various points since 1974. One of the most prominent, Hillsdale College professor Paul Rahe, summed up their findings as follows. While they all agree with Pocock that Machiavelli had considerable influence on later British and American thought, they believe the cause and effect connections between his Machiavellian moments are too direct. These authors caution historical actors shouldn't be read as semi-conscious speakers of somebody else's language, but they should be read as fully conscious agents for whom Machiavellian insights, while very important, must be weighed alongside other sources as well as their own experiences. In any case, Machiavelli's legacy was bound to become more diffuse over the 250 years separating 
Renaissance Florence from colonial Philadelphia. Finally, we must remember that men such as Franklin, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Adams were not abstract theorists, not like Algernon Sidney and John Locke and these others I've been talking about. They were statesmen practitioners engaged in designing real institutions that they hoped would foster enduring justice as well as liberty and prosperity. And that moral imperative of the American founders precluded a wholesale adoption of the, Florentine, uh, uh, the Florentines' system. Indeed, just consider George Washington. Oh, his statecraft was very realistic, both in war and in peace. But Washington displayed a character, the very opposite from that of a serpentine Machiavellian prince. Nevertheless, the years between the summoning of the First Continental Congress in 1774 and the ratification of the Constitution 15 years later were assuredly another Machiavellian moment in that earnest men gathered together to deliberate on how to craft a republic that might endure for centuries like the Venetian. And all the founders saw the wisdom of such Machiavellian notions as the separation of powers, checks and balances, an independent judiciary, sacrosanct private property, robust commerce, and political tumult. It was Jefferson, after all, who wrote, I hold it that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing and as necessary in the political world as in the physical, as, as storms in the physical world. Jefferson and Madison never admitted to having any Machiavellian ideas, but their libraries had all Machiavelli's books. All the founders' libraries had uh, contained Machiavelli. Um, and Jefferson and Madison certainly were influenced by people who were openly Machiavellian, such as Sidney, Locke, Montesquieu, and Hume. And Madison, for whom Machiavelli was required reading at Witherspoon's College of New Jersey, famously celebrated political factionalism. On the other hand, Madison's abhorrence of war was certainly not Machiavellian, but his arch rival, Hamilton, agreed completely with Machiavelli that republics, that republics are warlike and that successful ones needed an energetic executive ready and willing to prepare for war. And no American was more devoted to the Florentines' writings than John Adams. Adams not only studied Machiavelli, he quoted extensively from the discourses on Livy and the Florentine histories in his own three-volume Defense of the Constitutions of the United States of America, published in 1788. Moreover, Adams drew heavily on the English Commonwealth men, such as Needham and Harrington, whom he also discussed at length in his Defense of the Constitutions. Needless to add, the New England Puritan also critiqued Machiavelli on various constitutional points and broke with him entirely on moral questions. Adams, like Washington, believed religious faith to be an indispensable buttress for a healthy republic among the elites as well as the hoi polloi. And obviously, Adams thought it possible to fashion a republic through collective reflection rather than princely force and deceit. And therein lies the most trenchant critique of Pocock's thesis, I think, because the American founders, while eminently practical and exponents in most cases of the Scottish Enlightenment's common sense philosophy, were not simply utilitarian, which brings us full circle back to the Bible. In his classic, The Roots of American Order, 
Historian Russell Kirk explained that while the U.S. Constitution owed little to the example of the Israelites recounted in Deuteronomy and Judges, the American moral order was unthinkable without that Hebrew legacy. He noted that in John Adams' corpus of works, and it's large, um, uh, drew heavily, uh, which, which he knew drew heavily on Machiavelli's studies of Greek and Roman experience. Nevertheless, in all that great corpus, one finds no account of Israel and Judah. And yet, Adams knew their full import. In, in 1809, he wrote, quote, I insist that the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. Even if I were an atheist who believes that all is ordered by chance, I should believe that chance had ordered the Jews to preserve and propagate to all mankind the doctrine of a supreme, intelligent, wise, almighty sovereign of the universe, which is the essential principle of all morality and consequently all civilization. So what is it that we find when we study the origins of the Atlantic Republican tradition? We find that American institutions derived from a classical republicanism leavened by Hebrew republicanism, a Machiavellian body quickened by a biblical spirit, a civil government inspired by a civil religion. I therefore agree with Professor Rahe that while no American founder adopted Machiavelli's ideas without at least some reservations, the founders and those who came after them nevertheless owed Machiavelli a very great debt. Quote, to sort out the character of the American Revolution, Rahe concludes, one would do well to begin with the astonishing wave of political speculation that took place in the English Revolution, which itself was a product of that great revolution initiated in 16th century Florence by the sage after whom the devil himself came to be called Old Nick. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Walter. Uh, we do have some time for questions. Uh, let me just say that I think Walter's lecture perfectly illustrated the difference between a good historian and a great historian. A good historian makes the unfamiliar familiar. A great historian makes the familiar unfamiliar. <laughs> so uh, we'll open it up for questions. We have a few minutes for questions and the wait for the microphone to come to you but you have to raise your hand to let me know that you have a question. <laughs> Nelson Wolf back there on the side. Professor McDougall, if the state is defined, the government's defined as a monopoly on violence, control of violence, then the United States is exceptional because of the so-called Second Amendment. Could you please explain that? Huh. Well, I guess you'd say we're exceptionally behind the curve. <laughs> uh, the, uh, yes, the monopoly of violence uh, is, uh, is, is the great quest of the modern state. And, um, uh, and somehow the United States has never gotten modern. Even Australia has regulated firearms. Uh, and um, uh, I don't know how many other countries uh, are as freewheeling as the United States, but um, uh, that, that's, that, is, uh, that, that is a quirk. You can, call it, you can call it exceptional if you want to, but, you, but the idea of American exceptionalism as a positive um, and being a, a very general term that, that describes all kinds of things about the United States, obviously, uh, is not the same as picking out 
uh, this one particularly exceptional f flaw in, in the United States. I mean, good grief, we're exceptional for all kinds of things. We have more people in jail than any other country in the world. We have more people on drugs than any other country in the world. Uh, our rates of divorce and abortion and crime are, uh, you know, are, are off the charts. Uh, so uh, for all of those uh, uh, un unflattering ways, I guess you could say America is exceptional. In the back there. Yeah. Uh, first, I just want to say thanks so much for that unbelievably uh, lucid uh, commentary on what was really complex material. So thank you. Um, I was wondering if you would say a little more about uh, Venice and um, its, its I'd love to. Republican <laughs> run. <laughs> it's Republican run. Um, I'm really interested in the uh, separation of church and state comment that you said was uh, really had come out of this uh, time period of the high middle ages, along with many other uh, concepts that are familiar in the Enlightenment. Um, you mentioned that uh, Venice was nominally Roman Catholic, but really built on a civil religion. But then later you spoke of a symbiosis and it was um, it physically manifested in terms of the Doge's Palace and St. Mark's uh, Basilica. So I'm wondering what it is, separations, symbiosis? It, uh, um, that, that, that's a very uh, insightful question. Uh, I, um, I've been obsessing on civil religion for the last seven or eight years uh, and uh, have written a book about American civil religion. And um, it is a, 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 civil religions are mysterious, shape-shifting, uh, 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 forms of belief uh, that uh, are very hard to pin down because civil religion is constantly Look, civil religion amounts to vox populi, vox dei. Essentially, you know, the, the voice of the people is the voice of God. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, what, um, what the civil religion will dictate in a given century or a given decade um, can change 180 degrees uh, in some other century or decade depending on the mood of the population. Um, it's... Uh, 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 and, and, and its connection with, with uh, sectarian faith is therefore extremely problematical. Um, now, uh, I'm not an expert on, on, uh, on medieval history, um, so I'm, I'm, just, I'm just a tourist who happened to go to Venice, uh, and, uh, uh, and so I, I, I can't speak to all the nuances of a Venetian civil religion in, let's say, the 15th century or the 17th century. Um, except you can see it in the art, in the iconography. Uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the civil worship, the civic worship of, uh, uh, of the city itself and of its institutions uh, and uh, coexisting, coexisting with the, with the cult uh, of, of St. Mark in the cathedral, um, uh, they don't really get in each other's way. That's what it boils down to, I think. And the fact that Venice was thoroughly independent of the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope um, meant that outside authority uh, never you know, had a chance to impose itself, uh, for instance, impose you know, Catholic Church orthodoxy on Venice. In fact, Venice even had the power throughout most of this, uh, this, this, this millennium to appoint its own bishops. They didn't, they didn't have the papacy uh, you know, appoint their bishops for them. They were able to appoint their own bishops. It's marvelous. But um, uh, you, asked, you, you asked an awful lot in that question. There are various parts to it. Uh, but I, you, you asked me about, uh, specifically about what, what was special about Venice um, and something about the political uh, uh, arrangements there. Uh, that gives me an opportunity. I'm stealing the opportunity, as a matter of fact to tell you about the Venetian electoral system. Now, there's something called the Venetian ballot. Has anyone ever heard of that? Uh, and um, uh, it hasn't, uh, I'm gonna describe uh, the, the, the regulations now for the elections of the Doge, which were instituted in the year 1268 and remained in force all the way down to 1797. 
Their object was to minimize, as far as possible, the influence of great individual families. In other words, have, all the, have the families all of course, you know, balance and check and balance each other. And this was affected by a complex electoral machinery. Thirty members of the Great Council, you think, you think the, the Electoral College uh, in the United States is complicated and weird and irrational? Listen to this. Thirty members of the Great Council, chosen by lot, were reduced by lot to nine. The nine chose 40, and the 40 were reduced by lot to 12, who chose 25. The 25 were reduced by lot to nine, and the nine elected 45. Then the 45 were once more reduced by lot to 11, and the 11 finally chose the 41 who actually elected the Doge. <laughs> Isn't that how inventive? And to think that that bizarre system survived for like 500 years without any, uh, without, with almost no, uh, you know, uh, tumult or, or, or not tumult, but uh, without any challenge. You know, no one ever rose up and said, "Let's tear up our constitution and, and make it simpler." No, the Venetians knew what knew why that had been done. They knew what the positive effect of that almost at random um, form of election, uh, the, what the positive effects were. And the doges were, for the most part, extremely civil-minded people working for the good of the whole. I also learned my father was a patent attorney. And uh, I've studied a little bit about the history of American patent law and, uh, from my books. Um, but. Uh, I only just now learned uh, from an article called Constitutionalizing Patents from Venice to Philadelphia that the constitutionalization of patent law originated with the Venetian patent, patent statute of 1474, first in the world. And uh, then it evolved, just as with the story I told tonight, uh, patent law evolved through the English 1624 statute of monopolies and finally to the intellectual property clause of the United States Constitution. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Dennis, we owe you so much. <laughs> <laughs> um. I just want to... Uh... Thank you. I just want to thank Rabbi McDougall, I mean Professor McDougall, and uh, I want to thank in particular John and McDougall for taking Walter to Venice. It proved to be a very productive trip. I want to thank the Sattels and the Ginsbergs for support of this lecture, the Museum of the American Revolution for hosting and co-sponsoring this event, and I thank all of you for joining us. Thank you.